بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Last week we covered some prophecies with regard to the group that became known as the Khawarij and the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم made a number of different statements about them all the way from saying about a particular person that from his loins will come a people who will read the book of Allah but it will not go beyond their throats and when they will come out of the deen just like or they will miss the deen the main aspects and elements of deen just like an arrow sometimes misses the mark they will fight with the people of Islam based on their understanding based on their own justification it's related from Abu Dharr radiallahu anh that they will be the worst of the people Ali radiallahu anh who relates that kill them for in killing them is a reward for the one who kills them on the day of judgment they call towards the book of Allah yet they are not part of the people or the adherence of the book of Allah and one of their signs is that they will have shaved heads and then Ali radiallahu anhu had also spoken about the virtues of those who will fight with them because they were a major fitna they, they were a major fitna had large numbers several thousands of people had joined them and if they were not to be dealt with they were going to create a major problem and they did despite the fact that Ali radiallahu anhu fought against them over and over again and at times left seven of them at times left a few of them but yet they would just come back up one of them would go and rally others and they would come back up and he, Ali radiallahu anhu's entire caliphate just after the beginning after the arbitration took place which we discussed last week it was more behind them it seemed than it was in dealing with the rest of the lands and with other issues like with Muawiyah radiallahu anhu so they were very troublesome a major irritant that just would not go away you quell one side and they would spring up in another place you quell them and then some more spring up somewhere else and they just completely completely caused the army of Ali radiallahu anhu to become weary tired and completely weakened so that they did not have enough himma to then go and fight against the people of Sham to deal with that issue that's the hik- hikmah of Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted it to be that way but let us just look at how Ali radiallahu anhu dealt with them these when initially these people after Ali radiallahu anhu and Muawiyah radiallahu anhu had sent the two hakams the two arbitrators Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu and Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu and then the final conclusion of that was really nothing except that on paper what had happened was that they had both given up their pledges and because they were considered to be arbitrators on behalf of the official parties and cleverly due to some shrewdness on one side they had both well Ali radiallahu anhu's hakam or arbitrator who was Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu he had said okay fine I will give up Ali radiallahu anhu's pledge now he's supposed to be officially speaking on behalf of Ali radiallahu anhu so now when after that they both presented possible khalifs nominations none of them could agree on the others nomination except Abdullah ibn Umar but most likely he wouldn't accept so then it ended without anything but what it did end up with and which it gave gave the other side a room a room to argue was that Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu was arbitrating on behalf of Ali radiallahu anhu had said that okay we will relinquish Ali radiallahu anhu so that gave the other side the room technically speaking according to them if you look at it from their perspective that now there is no khalif 
the arbitrator from the, on behalf of the Khalifa has given him up. Which means officially now there's no Khalifa and it's open to all. It's up to the Muslims now. Now the issue that we had now was that the people of Iraq were a major problem for Ali radiallahu anhu. They're the ones who followed him but they could not be trusted. There were major disputes among them and they just could not agree on many things. Even though they're the only ones who eventually stayed with him. Because all the other areas were eventually overcome by Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. So Ali radiallahu anhu was left behind. Now in the midst of all of this, while all of this diplomacy is now taking place, Ali radiallahu anhu cannot now take another group or an army against Muawiyah radiallahu anhu to deal with this issue. Because according to Ali radiallahu anhu, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu had not represented him properly. So according to him, which was the correct opinion, is that he'd gone and done something that was beyond what he was supposed to do. They were supposed to negotiate some other kind of peace, but he had not. And that's why that was null and void, according to Ali radiallahu anhu. So according to Ali radiallahu anhu, his supporters and many of the Muslimin, it was, he was still rightful. In fact, according to the elect Sahaba, the Abdullah ibn Umar and the main ones, Ali radiallahu anhu was still supposed to be the main, uh, main khalif. But now Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu, they had room to maneuver on their side. So as that is all going on, Ali radiallahu anhu is dealing with these khawarij. Now after this arbitration took place, you had this group of people who went and encamped at a particular base, thousands of them. And they were led by their different leaders and they were under this ideology. Their ideology was that Ali radiallahu an and Muawiyah radiallahu an had made, had gone against the command of Allah, had gone against the book of Allah, the Quran. By putting, this arbit- by putting up these two arbitrators and they had not ruled according to the Qur'an. And this was their understanding. So now, when they had gathered there together, Ali radiallahu anhu tried to use diplomacy first to get them back. So he sent Abdullah ibn Abbas. Now because the argument was about the Qur'an, who better than Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu? And Ali radiallahu anhu could have gone himself because he was the most knowledgeable. But Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu was young and it was... A probably diplomacy to send him. When he got there, he spoke to them and they welcomed him first. They welcomed him and he introduced himself as coming from the most knowledgeable one and Amir al-Mumin, the, most clo- the closest to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and so on and so forth and they welcomed him. And he saw one thing that he noticed on them and this actually shows their very high piety, apparent piety. He saw the signs of sujood on their forehead. He saw the signs of sujood, the marks you know, the dark marks after doing a lot of sujood, a lot of prostrations. He saw that on their forehead as well. So these, these were not normal people. These were people who were extremely, you know, behind ibadah. But it was all dry worship. It was all uh, just an extreme pietist kind of movement. And they, their argument was this, that by this arbitration, they had committed a major sin. And a major sin took a person out of the faith and made a person a kafir. They didn't necessarily say that at that point, but they said that something major had been uh, perpetrated by the two sides. We were also part of it, initially. We were also part of it because, you know, we were there in, in the initial, initial fight when they had then decided that a meeting will take place afterwards under arbitration. You know, the initial time at the end of Sifin. They were with him. But we came back, they said, and we made tawbah. We, we repented. If Ali radiallahu anhu repents as well, and we completely agree that he was great and so on and so forth and everything, but this is a mistake that he's made and we've made as well. We've come back and made tawbah. If he makes tawbah, we're willing to go back with him and go and do whatever he, he tells us to do. Now, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu obviously explained to them that that they had a number of specific, this was their main idea. But the specific points that they said is that when they were writing out the, the treaty, Abu Musa al-Ashari and uh, the other side, why did Ali radiallahu anh, allow his being Amir al-Mu'minin to be removed? Because remember the other side, they said, well, you know, we don't agree with that. So he said, okay, fine, take it off. So Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, said, well, what's wrong with that? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa took off Nabiullah. You know when they were making a treaty with the people of Makkah many years before that. And the person from the other side, I think it was Suhail ibn Amr, he had said that we don't agree with you being the Prophet of Allah. So take that, you know, he had said, uh, you know, Min Muhammad, Rasulillah. We don't agree with that. So he took that off. Muhammad ibn Abdullah, he wrote. If the Prophet was allowed to do that, what's wrong with you? 
So there were a number of questions that they had like this, number of points that they had like this. So he responded in a number of in a number of ways. He said, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala Himself allows people allows a disputing husband and wife, a couple, to send arbitrators on each of their behalf. And if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has written islah for them and reform for them, then it will happen. Otherwise, it will not happen. In this case, it didn't happen. So Alhamdulillah, some of them understood. So 2,000 of them came back with him. They returned with him. But still, a number st- stayed there. Famous ones were Ibn al-Kuwa. That was one of them. There was Shibth ibn, ibn al-Rib'i al-Rayahi or Riyahi. He was one of them. They were leading the prayer. And then after that, they pledged their allegiance to a person called Abdullah ibn Wahab al-Rasibi. He is a big name in, among them. Abdullah ibn Wahab al-Rasibi. And then they went to Nahrawan. Nahrawan or Nahrawan. And then they started. Now, this is, you can say, now the, the kind of official group as such. And then they started doing some strange things. Now their point of view comes, comes forth. It wasn't a simple thing about this. They, their idea, their whole idea towards faith was something strange. They were, instead of being ashidda'u ala al kufari, ruhama'u baynahum, you know, severe against the enemies of the disbelievers and extremely merciful among their. Their, their own brothers and Muslimin, they were the opposite. Because when they got to Nahrawan, they, Nahrawan was in, was in that general area of Iraq and Persia at that time. So when they got there, they met one Nasrani, one Christian, and you know, they, they were on da'wah. So they had to give da'wah, they had to invite people to the faith. When they met that Nasrani, they gave him da'wah, they, gave him, they counseled him. And they met a Muslim and they killed him because he was not of their opinion. So they were very extreme. And you know, as I mentioned that all of these groups, though they did not live on Alhamdulillah, in their formal ways that they had initially at their inception, as the way they were at their inception, the ideology does creep up once in a while because it's a generic ideology. It's an extreme ideology where people are willing to just call, call people kafir and disbelievers on the smallest of things, on the smallest of disagreements. So you have to remember that. We learn a lot from learning about these groups that came up earlier on, these sectarians. Because they had generic ideologies, generic heretic ideologies, which then became a formal group as such, and had large numbers. Whereas nowadays you'll see some of these people as well, they don't necessarily become a big group, but there are people who who hold that ideology because it's a generic ideology. It's it's just a, a natural deviance, you can call it, to a certain degree. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't preserve somebody from, then they could fall into it. May Allah preserve us all. So, they killed the, they killed the Muslim and the Nasrani, they, they just gave him some counsel. And then, they, they, they used to say that, make sure you, you fulfill the way of your Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Then they met the great Abdullah ibn, uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Khabbab ibn al-Arat. Now, do you remember Khabbab ibn al-Arat, radiyallahu anh, one of the great Sahaba, who was one of the first to be martyred by... Abu Jahl, uh, Abdullah ibn Khabbab, this was Abdullah his son, he had a mushaf with him, he had a Quran with him, and he had, his, he had his wife with him who was pregnant. She was expecting. And, and they said to him that this which is hung over, around your neck, the Quran, is what in, instructs us to kill you. It's that Quran that instruct, is instructing us uh, to kill you. So, he, he just said, I mean, you know, as long as a person enlivens the Qur'an, you know, you should keep that person alive. And if the Qur'an says, whoever you should kill, then that I can understand. You know, he, would take it, he took it technically. And then they did some strange thing. One of them jumped up and there were some fruits on a tree or something. So he took hold of that, put it in his mouth. And the others, they began to get really angry with him. So then, you know, he threw it out again. And then another person... A, a pig came in front of him. You know, they were probably in that area. There was probably some swine around there. And one came in front of him. So he killed him. Now the others began to say that, oh, there's some facade in this is facade in the world. Now this is corruption that's taking place because some of these guys were acting crazy. So Abdullah ibn Khabbab said that, look, you've got no issue with me. You should have no issue with me. I'm a Muslim. They said, okay, re- relate a hadith from your father for us. So he said, I heard my father saying, I, uh, I heard my father relate that I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that takunu fitna there's going to be a fitna yamutu fiha qalbur rajul kama yamutu badanu there will be a time of fitna of trial and tribulation in which the heart of a person will die 
just like a person's body it dies and loses life. But it's difficult to, d- to see when the heart dies. It's very easy to see when there's a dead body. But to see the carcass of a dead heart is extremely difficult. So he said that the Prophet ﷺ said that such a fitna will arrive in which there will be the heart of a person will die just like his, his body dies. Yumsi mu'minan wa yusbihu kafiran that at night he will be a believer but in the morning he will be a disbeliever. And then he said the Prophet ﷺ said فَكُنْ عَبْدَ اللَّهِ الْمَقْتُولُ وَلَا تَكُنَ الْقَاتِلُ that Be the one who's killed rather than being the one who kills others. That was a wasiyah. They, then they asked him, now what do you say about Abu Bakr and Umar? Radiyallahu an. He, he praised them. Then they asked, what do you say about Ali radiyallahu an before the arbitration? They were very clear about, okay, before arbitration he was fine. And about Uthman radiyallahu an the first six years. So he praised, he praised them. Then he said, what do you think about this whole arbitration? So he says, all I, Abdullah ibn Khabbab responded that all I can say is that Ali radiyallahu an is more knowledgeable about the kitab of Allah than you are. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi called him the city of knowledge. And he is more careful about the deen than you people are. And he has greater insight. They said, you, you are not following the truth. You're not, you're, not following, you're not on guidance. You're not guided. You're just following the names of people because they've got big names. Then they took him closer to the, they took him close to the, the, the river bank and they slaughtered him there. It was after that that they moved on, they found a Christian person and they wanted to buy some dates or a date palm from him. And he said, you know what, just take it. Just take it. He didn't want to bother with it. And they said, no, 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 we can't, we can't take it unless we pay you. you. You need to charge us something. So he said, what strange people that you kill somebody like Abdullah ibn Khabbab and you can't even accept this palm from me without, without money. When this facade and this corruption of theirs and this chaotic movement of theirs reached Ali radiallahu an, he decided that he has to go and deal with them now. He has to go and deal with them now. So he took an army towards them. First, he sent Qais ibn Sa'ad to them and, who said, and said to him, that just give us, basically the request of Qais ibn Sa'id was that just give us those who murdered Abdullah ibn Khabbab because it's, uh, you know, that's a judicial demand that we're making and come back into this deen which you've just slipped out of and come back and join us in really fighting against our common enemy those who have gone against the Khilafah as such because you've, take, you've taken on a very strange ideology that you think we're committing shirk and you think it is permissible to spl- spill the blood of the Muslims. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu an, the great Sahabi, he was there. He said, Ibad Allah, we should both be on the same state that we were in earlier on. There should be no difference between us. What are you fighting for? What do you guys want to fight for? But they, they just would not listen. And they would not even give up the murderers of Abdullah ibn Khabbab. Now that, that was a transgression. You know, that was something that they had to give up because that was something that they had done. So Amir al-Mu'mineen, after trying his diplomacy of trying to speak to them over and over again, because it didn't work, he got his army together. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anh, first put up a flag of peace. And he says that anybody who comes under this flag, he is, he is he's free. There's nothing against him. He says, whoever does not fight and who does not come in front, he is, he is free as well. So they, they made it as clear as well. They didn't want to spill any more blood of the Muslimin. So they were giving them all of these possibilities. Whoever of you returns to Kufa or to Madain. By the way, there was no Baghdad at that time. Madain was the great city. And Madain was the city of the Khosros. That was their center of the, the Persian Empire. A majestic city. And that's the one where the pillars dropped when the Prophet ﷺ, the, the pillars of, of uh, one of the major areas of that palace dropped down when the Prophet ﷺ was born. You know, you hear about these pillars dropping in Madain. Madain was a major city. It's just south of Baghdad. It's in ruins right now. Ajib how some major cities are in ruins now. Baghdad is the new city. 
Anyway, whoever returns to Kufa or Madain and comes out of this group, then he is also at peace. We don't, you know, we don't want to kill our brothers. We have no need to do that. So Farwa ibn Nawfal, who was with them, with 500 people, he turned away and went to a place called Bandan Jabin and Daskara. Two places. They, they went back there. Another group went back to Kufa. Some of them would understand. Some of them who are not completely, who are not completely convinced about that ideology. Some went to Kufa. And about a hundred of them came back to Ali radiallahu anhu. With the Khawarij, there remained 2,800 people who did not stay for the rest of the day. They were all killed. I mean, in these, in these fights against the Khawarij, they were literally always nearly all killed. To the last of them, or maybe a few would escape. That's how they were. They were not very prepared, it seemed, at all. But they had this ideology which was driving them. And that's why we pr- seek protection from such an ideology. It's such an ideology that will cause people to do things when they have no preparation for it. And cause them to literally throw themselves into destruction. And I mean, you can see that from here. You know how many people survived from them? Eight. Eight individuals survived from these 2,000 and... 800. How many died from Ali radiallahu anhu's side? Nine. Nine died. That's it. Nine were martyred. And from their side, the only people that remained were eight. So, cleared everything up. Basically, whatever, whatever their equipment was, that was given as ghanima to, to the Muslim forces. Their women, he returned them back to their homes in Kufa, wherever they were. And those that were those that had gone back to Kufa. Remember the earlier group that had gone back to Kufa and those that had come under the flag of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. When they saw their people being killed, it gave them some, it brought up some feelings for them. So they got together now again and they made another group. It was, it was such an irritant for Ali radiallahu anhu. He deals with them where there's only eight left and then suddenly these other ones, they get up. Among them was Mustawrid, who was one of their big ones. He gave, them a, he gave them a sermon, getting them ready and preparing them against Ali radiallahu anhu. So they went to a place called Nukhayla. And again, Ali radiallahu anhu sent to them Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu to give them nasiha. They, re- they, they, they rejected it. They, they, did not, they didn't want to see him. So then again, Amir al-Mu'minin Ali radiallahu anhu went towards them. And at Nukhayla, he went and destroyed all of them again. He went and he finished them off there. Only five of them remained this time. Out of them was Mustawrid and Ibn Juwain al-Ta'i and Ibn Sharik al-Ashja'i. So five remained this time. Now, when he thought that he had finished with them, he went and he went back to his army and he's encouraging them to prepare against Sham because that was the main thing he had to deal with. This was just a side irritant that was wasting his energy and draining their their resources and supplies. They said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, after these various battles with the Khawarij, they said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, our arrows are finished. Our equipment, our suyuf, our, our swords, our spears, the head spearheads are blunt. And let's go back to Misr. Let's go back to Egypt first. To our, sorry, to our cities. So we can recoup we can recuperate we can re-prepare and maybe Amir al-Mu'minin Ali radiallahu anhu will be able to add others to our forces as well so that we can strengthen ourselves more against our enemy from this you can understand what their state was they were tired after Sifin after Jamal after after these skirmishes with the with the Khawarij and you can now understand where Ali radiallahu anhu is going with all of this. How you can, you can put yourself in his boots, you know, and, and think what's coming over him. Where he's been given this main task. He knows his right. He has the prophecies from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Yet everything seems to be going against him. It's like every day it was diminishing. Every day his power was weakening and waning. Despite the fact that he was so eloquent in terms of his speech, that he could, you know, he could incite a lot of people. Now he couldn't do it any longer. Despite all of that, these people were now sitting down. 
there were very few of them who were still standing strong with him as such. It wasn't that they were against him, it was just that they were completely tired and worn out. So he lost some, of, uh, some strong people to the Khawarij. Khirrit ibn Rashid and Naji. A number of others. I mean, some of them would come to him and they'd say, Ya Ali, wallahi la uti'u amrak. I'm not going to be obedient to you anymore. I'm not going to listen to you anymore. I'm not going to pray behind you anymore. And tomorrow I'm leaving. This one person came and said that. Now Ali radiallahu anhu dealt with him on principle. He said that then you would be disobedient to your Lord. And you're going to be breaking your treaty. Don't destroy yourself. Don't harm yourself. Let me know why are you doing this? What's your problem? Why do you want to leave me tomorrow? He said because you've allowed this arbitration to take place. And you have weakened yourself from standing up for the right and for the truth. And you've basically inclined yourself to people who are oppressors. So that's why I can't do that. He says, you know what, why don't you come to me and I'll discuss the matter with you. I'll discuss the matter with you in the light of the Quran and the Sunnah. And we will have a discussion about it, we'll have a debate about it. And then after that you can make up whatever decision you want. You will realize that I am not wrong in what I'm doing. So he says, okay, fine, I'll come. So Ali radiallahu anhu said, look, let the shaitan not overcome you. Make sure that the shaitan doesn't mislead you now. You said you're going to come, make sure that you come. Make sure shaitan doesn't take you away. And make sure that ignorance does not lead you to do that which is wrong. I'm, I guarantee you that if you come, wallahi, if you come, then I'll be able to guide you to the, to the true way. He did not listen. He'd made up his mind. So he went with a number of people to the area of Babylon, which is around Kufa. He went and he, st- he stayed there with, a gr- with his group. Ali radiallahu sent a person called Ziyad ibn, ha- uh, Ziyad ibn Khasfa al-Bakri behind him. And, in, and then there was negotiations with him. Eventually they killed a person. One of the Muslimin, they killed him. So then Ziyad went behind him and said, you know, whoever's killed this person, give them back to us if you don't want to come back. They, they responded, they said, no, we're not going to give him back. It's typical Khawarij. We're not going to give him, we're not going to give him up to you. We're not going to surrender them to you. So Ziyad radiallahu said to Khirrit, oh Ziyad said to Khirrit, that what is your problem with Amir al-Mu'mineen? Discuss it. He said, no, 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 I can't agree with him to be the Imam. And, and so on, the, the, the whole same argument that, that he had brought before. Ziyad radiallahu anhu, Ziyad tried to do different things with him, saying that, is there anybody more knowledgeable than Ali radiallahu anhu, more closer to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, more pious, more this, more that. And they, they just would not agree. He said, okay, why did you kill that man, the Muslim? He said, I didn't kill him, it was, it was some of our group. Okay, give them to us, because no, no, I can't give them up to you. So they were just playing strange. They were just playing strange. Finally, when, that, when, Ziyad, when Ziyad saw that, he went back to Basra. And he fought with them. Ziyad, they, they, there was nothing else he could do, so he fought with them. And again, they, they dispersed. They killed whoever they killed, and then the others dispersed. After that, Ali radiallahu anhu had Ma'kal ibn Qais al-Rayahi sent with 2,000 people behind these khawarij. And he wrote to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu who's in Basra that he should send another 2,000 to go and fight with, with them. So Ma'kal went and the people of Basra, the army of Basra also got together. They found the khawarij by the mountains of Ram Hurmuz and this is, this is all in Persia 70 of Ma'akal's people were, were killed Khirrit and some of his, some of his companions they, they obviously were defeated and Ali radiallahu told Ma'akal to go behind him until he finished off the rest of them as well but Khirrit was also killed after that. So that was another contingent of theirs that they destroyed. After that, another group of the Khawarij stood up against Ali radiallahu an. So every time he would put down one, there would be another one there. Now if you look at Muawiyah radiallahu an, while all of this is going on, what is Muawiyah radiallahu an doing? Now you have to remember that where Muawiyah radiallahu an begins with is that it's open right now. The Khilafah is open. The Muslimin have to, the Muslimin have to decide on their leader. 
He had one thing which Ali radiallahu did not have. He had respect and obedience. Well, he had obedience rather. That all the people in Sham, they were behind him fully, 100%. In fact, in terms of following orders, this army was one of the greatest. So he decided that, look, there's all of this chaos going on. The Khilafah is open. I'm going to see what I can do. So he decided to take the matter in his hands to try to bring some kind of unity in the Muslim lands. Enough was enough in terms of the disputes. So he decided to do what he decided to have everybody pledge allegiance to him. Because he reckoned that he could take care of this matter. So he sent to Misr, he sent to Egypt Amr ibn al-As radiallahu an. Now remember, they're in Sham. Sham is Syria in general, in that general area. You had Sham, you had Egypt, you had Persia, and then you had Mecca and Medina. You know, the, the Hijaz in general, and Yemen, and so on and so forth. So you had these major areas. I would say the major areas were Sham, which is current day Syria, the Levant. Then you had Persia, which is Baghdad, all the way Iran, and all of those areas, right? All the way up to Azerbaijan, Armenia, all of that was taken during Uthman the Allah on his time. Then you had Egypt. Now, Egypt, the conqueror of Egypt was who? Amr ibn al-As radiallahu an. The same Amr ibn al-As who is now with Muawiyah radiallahu an. So you had these three major areas that were outside of the Hijaz as, as such. Right? So now you can understand we've got these four major areas. Ali radiallahu anhu is in Kufa. And he's got the people of Basra Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu is the governor right now. So he's got the people of Bas, uh, the people of uh, Bagh, uh, the people of Iraq behind him, but Sham is all and is stable. Iraq is not stable. Then you've got Misr and Egypt. So he sends Amr ibn al-As an to Egypt. But before he gets there, let's find out what happened in Egypt. This is becoming a bit of a history lesson as opposed to signs of the Day of Judgment. But I think we should know this. Because I don't know when we're going to have a history lesson. So inshallah, it will be beneficial. So let's talk about Egypt first, after they had given bay'ah in the beginning. So Amr ibn Asr the Allah goes there, but what does he find and what had happened until now? So we're going back right now. So what happened with Ali radiallahu an is that, uh, what happened with Egypt was that Ali radiallahu an, when he was given the pledge, he sent Qais ibn Sa'd ibn Ubadah, Sa'd ibn Ubadah's son Qais, to, uh, to Egypt. And the people there had given the pledge to him, except a small group who stayed aside. They remained aloof. Yazid ibn al-Harith al-Dulji, who was, who was one of them, those that kept aside, he was one of those who felt that Uthman radiallahu anhu's murder had to be avenged first. He was of that thought. You can, these were two mainstream ideologies in the Muslim at that time, feelings. There was a large group of people that felt that Uthman radiallahu's murder was so great it needed to be dealt with. Right? Because this was the first time that he was murdered by a group of people. You see, Abu Bakr or Umar radiallahu anhu was also murdered, but he was an individual that was dealt with. There was no conspiracy there. Whereas with Uthman radiallahu there was a major conspiracy and they, they, they just felt that this was significant, serious, and that had to be dealt with. So these were, he was one of them. He left them to the side. Muslim ibn Makhlad. Was, was with him as well. But this case, he was, he was intelligent. The, the governor that Ali radiallahu anh sent, he left them alone. He left them alone because he felt that they were not really harmful to him. If they don't want to come, if they don't want to pledge allegiance to Ali radiallahu that's fine. Leave them because I know if I push them, there's going to be an issue. So let's leave them alone. However, when Amir al-Mu'min Ali radiallahu anhu heard about it, he, he, he wrote to him saying that he should go and fight with them if they don't pledge the allegiance. See, because for Ali radiallahu anh, he was looking from an authority point of view that you can't have little pockets being against you because they're going to rise up one day. They eventually did. But obviously you could argue about why they did that. But from Ali radiallahu perspective, he was completely right. What the governor was doing, he was right according to politically from his position as well. So you know, you, you have to remember there's many perspectives in this and they were all probably all right in a sense, right? So Ali radiallahu anh, he said that, he said, no, you have to go and deal with them so that they will come. Now, when, because his, his feeling was, and he, you know, he's had this experience with the Khawarij and so on, he said that the biggest fires are, are, are created by these smallest groups, right? So don't think that, you know, you're going to just leave them passive. So Qais wrote to him, he said that, Amma ba'd, I am very surprised by your command. You want me to kill 
a group of people who are abstaining from you. They're allowing you the time to spend behind your other enemies. They're not causing a problem here that you have to go against them. Leave them. They're not doing anything. They're leaving you to do what other things that you need to do. If we're going to push them, then they're going to help your enemies against you. They're going to uh, ally, them, ally themselves with your enemies. So please listen to me in this year, Amir al-Mu'mineen, and, and leave them alone. If that's the case, you know, if that's your opinion, then and wassalam. Ali radiallahu was not very happy with that. He, he took him off the governorship. And he gave it to Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, Abu Bakr radiallahu son. When he went there, he went to the masjid and he made a khutbah. And in that he praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you know, he talked to them about this. And he said to them, you know, as, you know the, the inception, uh, inauguration khutbahs that they give, which is that as long as I'm truthful and correct and right, you will follow me. And where I'm wrong, then you will, cor- uh, you, you will set me, uh, you will set me uh, aright and so on and so forth. Then he got off. Now, after about a month that he's, he'd been there, then he went, uh, he sent somebody to these small group of people that had kept aside. And he gave them the, uh, the, the option that they would either become obedient and took the, take the pledge, or they should leave Misr in Egypt. They responded that we're not going to do either. We're not going to do either and leave us for a while until we see where, what we want to do. Right now we're not going to do anything, but leave us alone. We need to make a decision about what we're going to do. And don't, don't hurry, don't rush to fight with us. Don't rush to fight with us. But he, he denied that. He responded that, no, that's not going to work with us. So they began to protect themselves. They began to you know, set up defense for themselves. And that is around the time when Sufin was taking place. Right? When Sufin was taking place. When Sufin had finished and they had protected themselves from uh, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr and now the arbitration was going to take place and then the arbitration took place. So you see, they were going to see which position they were, where they had to go. They were, they were, you know, they were being clever about what they were supposed to do. Finally, they said, okay, no, we can't, re- we, we can't agree to what you say. So they denied his invitation for the pledge. So he sent a small group to fight against them. And they killed the leader. They killed their leader. And again, no, actually, he sent, he sent a contingent against them. And they killed the leader of that contingent. They sent, he sent another. And again, they killed the leader. Then Muawiyah ibn Hudayj, a Sakuni, from them, he came up, he came out and he wanted to seek the blood, the revenge for Uthman radiallahu anhu. When Amir al-Mu'min found out that this was all happening, he saw that Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr radiallahu anhu is not strong enough to deal with this matter. He's not strong, he's not going to be able to do, deal with this. So then he made Ali, uh, sorry, Ali radiallahu anhu made Ashtar ibn al-Harith al nakhai the governor of Egypt, and said, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr had to uh, leave the post. He wrote to Ashtar, but as Ashtar was on the way, he passed away. But Muhammad ibn, Hanafi, uh, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr radiallahu anh, found out about this, and obviously he felt bad. So Ali radiallahu anh, when he heard that he's got this bad feeling, he wrote him a letter, and he said that I've heard that you are feeling bad about this, that I had made Ashtar the Khalif. Uh, sorry, the governor. I didn't do this to go against you in any way or anything like that. It was just to deal with the situation. So there's the, the khutbah and then he told him. So Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr was content again. However, when it's now the 38th year, Muawiyah radiallahu anh, sends uh, Amr ibn As radiallahu anh. So that, that's where we got to. When Muawiyah radiallahu anh, sends Amr ibn As radiallahu anh, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr is the governor of Egypt. Amr ibn As radiallahu anh, he's the one who conquered Egypt. From? From who? From the disbelievers before. Right? So he sends Amr ibn As radiallahu anh, in six, with 6,000 people. With an army of 6,000. They, they get close to Egypt. And those people who had, 
who were against Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr radiallahu anh, they came out and joined with Amr ibn As radiallahu anh, his group asking for the blood of Uthman radiallahu anh, to be avenged so he got together with them he wrote to Muhammad he, went, he wrote to Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr by saying that just move away from you know you need to move away from our way O oh, son of Abu Bakr because I don't want even a nail of mine to touch you you know, I, I don't want you just just move aside. The group, the, the the people in this area, they have gathered against you, and they're going to be surrendering you up anyway. So, leave the area. I am just being, I'm your well wisher in this regard. So Muhammad wrote to Ali radiallahu and informing him of this new setup now and asking him for reinforcement, asking for help. So, Ali radiallahu anh told him that he needs to get all of his group together around him and told him to be patient about it and that he would be sending an army behind him. So, Muhammad got up among the people and he encouraged them and, in, and he gave them a lot of encouragement to come along with him. 2,000 people got together with him and he made Kinana ibn Bishr their leader. They went towards Amr to fight with the 6,000 that he had brought. But these people of Egypt, they lost. And Kinana, Kinana was killed. When Muhammad, those people who were still with Muhammad, heard about this, they all dispersed. And he went and hid somewhere. Now, Amr radiallahu anh gone and he went and he went and settled down in the Fustat. The Fustat. Egypt or Cairo rather which is around which this entire thing was happening that was Egypt Cairo is a an amazing city a very historical one it's a city where still today you can see about eight to ten different civilizations and the you can see marks of the sovereignty of eight to ten different civilizations there rather than civilizations different rules and dynasties so this is a bit of a transgression here, but you've got on the other side in Giza or Giza, you've got the Pharaonic side of things. Then you've got the Mamluks and their great mosque, you know, Kawalun complex and this madrasa and that one. Then you've got the Ayyubids, Salahuddin, uh, and you've got, uh, you know, the Qal'a, uh, you've got the, the fort, that's Salahuddin, Ayyubis, right? Then you've got Ibn Tulun, so you've got the Tulun dynasty. You've got the Ibn Tulun Mosque. Then you've got the Fustat, the Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu Masjid, the massive Masjid, which is kind of towards the south of Cairo, right? You've got that, south of old Cairo, kind of. Then you've got the Fatimids. Azhar was built by the Fatimids. Then you've got, uh, you, you've got Muhammad Ali Basha, the Uthmanis. You've got literally eight to ten different dynasties still where you can see their Athar today. You can still see the remnants of them and, you know, some of those complexes are ajib. Cairo is an amazing city in that regard. So he went and settled in a place called Fustad. That's, I think, where the masjid of Amr al-Asad is today. Right? It's a massive masjid. That's where that Sheikh Jibreel uh, lead, used to lead the Tarawih. Muawiyah ibn Hudayj, he was one of those who had been on the side. He went and he went behind Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr until he caught up with him and he killed him. When his murder, Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, when his murder news of his murder reached Ummul Mu'minin Aisha radiallahu anha she became she was extremely grieved by this a very beloved brother of hers to her and uh, the children of uh, children of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr she took them close to her and and but by the murder of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr Egypt came under the control of Muawiyah radiallahu anha all of the people of Egypt, they went and pledged allegiance to Muawiyah radiallahu anh. And as far as the group that Ali radiallahu anhu, the army that Ali radiallahu was sending to help Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr when he had called for it, they heard, as they were on their way, they heard that Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr had been, had been killed. So they went back. So that's Egypt has fallen to Muawiyah radiallahu anh. So now you've got Iraq. And obviously you've got the Hijaz meaning Makkah and Medina and the surrounding areas, the Arabian Peninsula. In Egypt, you had two main cities. 
One is where Ali radiallahu was residing, that was Kufa. And the other one was Basra. Madain had probably lost its glory. There were other areas around. So now, when the Egypt, when Egypt was overcome, Mu'awiyah sent Abdullah ibn al-Hadrami to Basra. Ziyad ibn Abi Sufyan. Ziyad ibn Abi Sufyan was the governor of Basra at that time. But he was only a governor in place of Ibn Abbas because Ibn Abbas had gone out. So he was a replacement. So he was dealing with Basra at the time. A number of Banu Tamim got together with Ibn al-Hadrami who Mu'awiyah had sent because they were also of the ideology of calling for the blood of Uthman radiallahu anhu to be avenged. So you can see how they're getting their supporters because of the ideology that's there as well. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu's police force in Basra, the person at the top of that was Dahaq ibn Qais. He got up and he said that you guys have come, may Allah disfigure it, and he prayed against it. We are completely convinced and we're still on the bay of Ali radiallahu anhu. He does, you know, he praised him and so on and so forth. Are you saying that we need to go against him? So he was trying to talk on, along those lines. But Abdullah ibn Hazim as sulami he got up and he said to Dahak, you be silent, you don't have any right to speak. And he said, then began to say to Abdullah ibn al-Hadrami that we're going to help you, we're going to be assisting you. When Ziyad saw that, he went and he took refuge in a place called Azd. And then he informed Ali radiallahu and sent somebody to Ali radiallahu an. So Ali radiallahu anh sent Ayun ibn Dubay'a al-Mujashi'i al-Tamimi al-Tamimi who was one of his men but he sent him because these Tamimi, these Tamimis were against him in Basra so he thought that if he sends this Tamimi he might be able to bring them out and away from the other side. But he was, he was assassinated. So before he was able to speak to them, he was assassinated. Then Ali radiallahu anh sent Jariya ibn Qudama al-Sa'di. He went there and first he went to Azd and he thanked them first from Amir al-Mu'mineen for helping out, uh, for helping out Ziyad ibn Abi Sufyan. And he then went and read to the people of Basra the letter of Ali radiallahu anh, which Ali radiallahu anh was warning them and you know, telling them things. That if, he, if they would continue to support, then he, then he would basically fight against them and it would be worse than Jamal. That, you know, this time... Was, because remember, the people of Basra were the ones who had supported Aisha radiallahu anha and Talha and Zubair radiallahu anha and Ali radiallahu had fought against them. So, majority of the people of Basra responded to Ali radiallahu anha in a good way. And they went to Ibn al-Hadrami and they fought with him until they were able to overcome him. So, they, they finally killed Abdullah ibn al-Hadrami as well. But, so, Basra did not fall to Muawiyah radiallahu anh, but he did not stop there. He went and he sent to other areas. And slowly, slowly, many of the other areas began to come under his rule. So, Kufa and Basra are still not there. Finally, it was Hajj time. And Muawiyah radiallahu anh sent Yazid ibn Shajarah to Makkah. So that he could be the Amir of the Hajj, the Hajis from the Sham. And he would also ask the people to pledge allegiance to Muawiyah radiallahu anh. Ali radi- uh, the, the, the person who was the governor there at the time, who was in charge there through Ali radiallahu anh was Kuthm ibn Abbas. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anh's brother. Kuthm ibn Abbas. But obviously he didn't have enough power to fight against, against these people. So he didn't do anything. They just kept it peaceful. And the two leaders, one was Qutham ibn Abbas, and then from the other side was Shajara. Basically the agreement was that none of them would lead the prayers. So there wouldn't be an argument, and the people would just make whoever they wanted to uh, the, be the imam. Anyway, after that, the hajj passed, alhamdulillah. Hajj passed well, and no corruption took place in Makkah. Because that's a haram, that's a sanctified location. Now each side wanted... To, get, to take over larger sites so that they could come. Each had their own idea and each thought they were justified. But Hijaz and Yemen, eventually they also f- 
fell under Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. They entered into the pledge with Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. Busr ibn Artat al-Amini was sent and they did not remain with Amir al-Mu'mini. Now remember he wasn't there. He was in Kufa. So the Hijaz and Yemen, Yemen was always kind of separate at the, in the south. They fell, uh, they entered with Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. The only people that were left were the people of Iraq and the surrounding areas, the small area of surrounding areas of Persia. The problem is that that whole area was filled with fire. That whole area was filled with chaos. And there was a group who were with Ali radiallahu an. The others were Khawarij who did not want Ali or Muawiyah radiallahu an. And then there were a group of munafiqeen or hypocrites who would express their obedience to Ali radiallahu an. And yet inside they would they harbored great enmity. So they tired out Amir al-Mu'minin Ali radiallahu an. So many times he spoke to them in his khutbah. He was so eloquent. His Arabic was so beautiful, if you, if you read some of his Arabic. But nothing would work. Finally, in the 40th year after Hijrah, in the 40th year after Hijrah, that's 30 years after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. 40 years after Hijrah is 30 years after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him respite. And he gave him peace. Away from all of this. And he had him go and join his brothers among the shuhada, the martyrs, and the pious. And what better friends than those. And what happened is, these khawarij were constantly being beaten by him. Everywhere they went. Eventually they decided that we need to take care of this matter. And the only way they said they could do this is that we need to finish all three of them off. Amr ibn al-As, Muawiyah, and Ali radiallahu anhu. So Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, al-Muradi was sent to Kufa for Ali radiallahu anhu. Burq ibn Abdullah al-Tamimi to Sham against Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. And the third one was Amr ibn Bakr al-Tamimi to, to Egypt where now Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu was. They decided among themselves, they planned on a particular night they would assassinate these three. Burq went to Muawiyah radiallahu an and waited for him in the, in the morning prayer. And he hit him with a sword. Now Muawiyah radiallahu was very big. He was known to be very big and quite, uh, mashallah, um, well endowed, right? So he hit him on his buttocks, but he, he did not kill him. He was grabbed obviously and he was killed in retaliation for that. So Muawiyah was saved. Allah had plans for him. As far as Amr ibn Bakr, the one who went after Amr ibn As radiallahu an, it was Amr ibn As radiallahu an's fortune on that day that he was sick and he was ill so he didn't come out for Fajr. He prayed at home. Kharij ibn Habib al-Sahmi was leading the prayer in place of Amr ibn As radiallahu an. Now this Kharij, he didn't plan very well, did he? He didn't know who he was supposed to kill. So he thought that was Amr ibn As radiallahu an, and he killed him. And then he was obviously caught and killed. Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, on the other hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had something else. Ali radiallahu anhu had to be extricated from this and to be sent to the best of friends. He went to Kufa and he waited for Amir al-Mu'mineen in that morning of that night in which they had all agreed that they would assassinate. It was a Friday night. It's such a night they, they pick. Friday night, 17th of Ramadan. Is that the Battle of Badr? What was that, the 19th? Is that the 17th, the Battle of Badr? I remember something like that. Amir al-Mu'mineen, despite all of this, he's calling people for Fajr. He's announcing to people, he's calling people for Fajr, As-Salat, As-Salat. And while he's doing that, this person attacks him, saying, Al Hakamu Lillah La Lak, Ya Ali, Wala Li Ashabik, that Al Hukmu Lillah, the command, the legislation is for Allah only. And it's not your prerogative, Ya Ali, nor for your companions. Ali radiallahu anhu says, Make sure that you don't lose this man. So they, they grabbed him. Ja'ad ibn Hubayra came and he, he led the prayer. The Fajr, the Fajr Salat. Then Ali radiallahu anhu, he gave some final nasa'ih. 
he gave some final advices. He said, An nafs, an nafs, a life has to be taken for a life. In halaktu faktuluhu kama qatalani. If I am to die in this, then he has to be killed. Only he has to be killed because he has killed me. If I remain, if I survive, then I'll see what I'm going to do with him. So he was just making sure that people don't transgress. It's not that he's saying, make sure you kill him. He was trying to say that a life for a life. So yes, you can kill him if I am to die. But if I don't die, then I'll take care of it. I'll see what I'm going to do. And then he said, Ya Bani Abdul Muttalib, make sure that I don't see you going and making the blood of other Muslims halal because of this. You're going to say that Amir al-Mu'mineen was killed. Now remember, he had been dealing with this for Uthman until now. The whole problem until now was stemming from that. He did not want a second problem to come up. That a group of Ali was saying that we want to avenge Ali. So he's very careful about this. But I guess people's emotions take over their minds. I don't want anybody to say that Amir al-Mu'mineen has died, has been killed. And I don't want anybody to be killed except the one who killed me. Check, oh Hassan, make sure you watch that if I am to die from this, from this strike of this assassin, then make sure that he is only struck that much as well. And do not mutilate him. Because I've heard the Prophet ﷺ saying that beware, be careful of muthla. Abstain from muthla. Muthla means mutilation. Even if it's from, even if it's from mad dog, don't mutilate. Because that's transgression. That's over and beyond what needs to happen. Jundub ibn Abdullah came in and he said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, if we don't find you any longer, if we see you no longer, then should we give pledge to Hassan radiallahu an? So Ali radiallahu an said, Look, I'm not going to command you to do it, neither am I going to prohibit you to do it. You are more knowledgeable about that. You make your own decision about that. I'm not, I'm not going to name the next Khalifa after me. It's up to you. Then he called Hassan Hussein radiallahu an. And now this is extremely emotional. This is extremely emotional. You can see this is the last moments of his life. He's just been struck. Now he doesn't have just Hassan and Hussein. He has another son from another wife, not from Fatima radiallahu anha. And he's older. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya. Supposed to be Muhammad ibn Ali. But he's attributed to his mother, Hanafiyya. Her name was Hanafiyya. She was another wife of Ali radiallahu anha. A great man, a great person. So, firstly, he calls Hassan and Hussein radiallahu and he says to them, Usikuma bi taqwa Allah. I counsel you to uphold the taqwa of Allah. Don't hanker over the dunya, even if it hankers over you. Don't cry over things that have been taken away from you. Say the truth. Say the truth and have mercy on the orphans. He's remembering all of these things. I mean, this was a complete man. This is a you know, complete sahabi. And make sure that you help the people who are wasted, meaning people who can't do anything for themselves. And make sure you work for the akhirah. And you always oppose the zalim. Make sure you always op- oppose the oppressor. And that you are always assisting the oppressed ones. And act according to that which is in the book of Allah. And do not, do not, be frightened of the criticism of anybody when it comes to following the book of Allah. And then he turned to Muhammad al-Akbar. Muhammad was older. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya. And he said to him, Have you heard and recorded what I have just said to your two brothers? He said, Yes. So he said, I am also counseling you with the same thing. And I am counseling you and I am bequeathing to you, impressing upon you that you honor your two brothers because of the higher right that they have. Why do they have a higher right? Because they're the sons of Fatima radiallahu anha. So make sure that you, you, fulfill their, you fulfill their commands and don't ever do anything against them. Then he said to Hassan and Hussein, so this wasn't supposed to be one-sided. He turned to Hassan and Hussein as well. Now you can imagine a father, imagine ourselves and may Allah protect us. But imagine ourselves in this position when you've got your children and you're, you have to say these things to them. I mean, imagine the feelings in your heart, the emotions. You know, it's, 
this is a great lesson for all of us that hopefully we'll never be in that situation but we do have to give some wasiyah before we die to our children so look at the things he's saying and then he says to Hassan and Hussein I also instruct you about him because he's your brother he is your brother and he is the son of your father Shaqiq meaning he's your half brother and he is the son of your father and you know that your father used to love him and then he said to Hassan radiallahu an I tell you I, I, I impress upon you I counsel you to hold on to the taqwa of Allah and to establish the prayer on its time Salat even at that time sure they were praying I mean these were, these were sahaba I mean they were praying subhanallah and to give zakat to its rightful recipients husnul wudu good wudu excellent wudu not just the rushed wudu subhanallah he's telling of these what we would think consider basic things فَإِنَّهُ لَا صَلَاةَ إِلَّا بِتَهُورٍ There is no salat without, without wudu. And then he said, the Salat is not accepted from the one who doesn't give zakat in its proper place. And seek, I also counsel you to seek forgiveness, to always make istighfar, and to control your anger. كَظْمِ الْغَيْظِ Control your anger. And to fulfill the rights of kinship. And to be forbearing, from, uh, uh, forbearing when it comes to dealing with ignorant people. And to have insight into the deen. Tafakkuh fi deen. And to be firm when you stand up for any matter. And to look after the rights of the Quran. And to look after the rights of the city of Medina or to look after the rights of your neighbors. And amr bil ma'roof. Commanding the rights and prohibiting the wrong. And abstaining from, uh, abstaining from lewd acts. And then he, he kept on, then after that he kept remember, you know, he kept dhikr of Allah, he kept uh, engaged in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until he passed away. Hassan Hussein radiallahu an gave him the ghusl and his nephew Abdullah ibn Ja'far. And then he was shrouded in three pieces of cloth in which there was no qameez. And Hassan radiallahu an read over him seven takbirs, he led the prayer. Ali radiallahu an, how long was this khilafah? It was for four years and seven months and some days. Four years, seven months and some days. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had intended with him that he deal with all of these matters, all of these disputes and these differences. And one of the wisdoms in this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was teaching the ummah to come later. Because the Sahaba were there for the teaching of the rest of mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen them to be around His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now, before that, this blessed group were to finish, before the last of them were to leave this world, all of these things were being made to take place. So that the ummah that came later, the generations that came later like us, would be able to look at them and see how they dealt with matters when these matters came up to be the way they were. And rather than looking at them in a matter that because they did it, it's okay if we do that as well. Or there's a number of people who take a very fatalistic approach to this. They say, well, they fought. So what's the big deal if we fight? And they don't try to make amends. They don't try to do better. This was a lesson that we had to learn from. That we can abstain from this. And to see how Ali radiallahu anh, dealt with these matters with great forbearance and great piety and so on and so forth. Now you have to remember that despite the fact that in the battle of Uhud, now it was just like to show, and it was also to teach certain people a lesson at the time as well. That you have to act up in the right way. Because when you leave your faith, then this is the kind of thing that would happen. Like in the battle of Uhud, when those 50 archers, they did not listen to the instructions that were given. They, they suffered they suffered after that, despite the fact that they were victorious in the beginning. Then when it came to the Hawaz, and it was the same thing, that they thought they had so many people that they were going to win. The Muslims thought they were going to win. So their abundance in number got to their heads in a bit as, as such. So then they, again, they suffered a setback. So these, these were, this was all from that aspect that all of this was happening during that time so that people could be taught and people could learn from this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted that to happen. When Ali radiallahu anhu passed away, and he was martyred and he was buried. The people of Kufa, they gave the allegiance to Hassan. 
And the first person to give that allegiance was Qais ibn Sa'd ibn Ubadah. He said to him, spread your hands, extend your, your hands so that I may take the pledge. And on the book of Allah, he said, on the book of Allah, on the sunnah of his messenger, and on killing those who make certain things halal in the religion that are not supposed to be halal. Hassan radiallahu an was extremely gentle, had a lot of jamal. It's a very beautiful character, completely away from any form of dispute and disputation. He had a great amount of forbearance and his approach was always very gentle. So he says, no, no, no. On the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger. Because they will come with everything anyway. So then the people, they pledge their allegiance with him on that. Now Hassan radiallahu an, Hassan radiallahu an, Ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, his mother was Fatima binti Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was born in Medina Munawwara in the third year after the Hijrah. And he was, among all people, the one who resembled the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam most closely. His resemblance as a grandchild of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very close to that of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would love him greatly. Just loved him abundantly. Him and his brother Hussein. And he said about Hassan, that Allahumma inni uhibbuhu fa ahibbahu wa ahbib man yuhibbuh. Say you love Hassan radiallahu an. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has prayed for you. Allah, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Oh Allah, in his dua to Allah, Oh Allah, I love this person. I love this person, you love him as well. <laughs> Look at that statement. It's just such an expression of love, obviously. He loved him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala probably loves him as well. He says, I love him, so Allah, oh you love him as well. And oh Allah, love the one who loves him. And with regards to him, and again, this is another prophecy. So this, this links in with our series here, as Bukhari has related in his Sahih. That Ali uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that inna ibni hadha sayyid, that this son of mine, meaning my grandson, is a leader. He's a sayyid, he's a leader. Wala Allah an yusliha bihi bayna ta'ifatayni azimatayni min al mu'mineen. And maybe Allah, it is hoped that Allah will reform, will bring together, will re reconcile by Him two major groups of the believers. Two major groups of the believers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use Hassan radiallahu anhu to bring them together. Now these two groups... We, we understand who he's speaking about, but he's saying there were two big groups of the Muslimin and Mu'minin. He said actually Mu'minin, actual believers. They were both on the haq and the truth, except that Ali radiallahu an had got it right, and the other ones had got it wrong in terms of the, the methodology. But in terms of being believers, they were both believers. He was unable to, in terms of the earlier days with the Prophet ﷺ, he was not able to attend any of the battles with the Prophet ﷺ because he was too young. I mean, he was born in the third year of Hijrah. So when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, how old was he? He was probably around seven years old. When the Prophet ﷺ passed away, he just passed seven years of age. And when Umar radiallahu an, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an, when he allotted a share uh, for the people of Badr, that every year they'll get this much, he also gave a share, allotted a share for Hassan radiallahu an because of his closeness to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was one of them though who had defended Uthman radiallahu an. He was there, him and his brother were there uh, trying to defend Uthman radiallahu an. And he had obviously received a lot, of, uh, a lot of hindrance in that regard as well. A lot of grief in that regard, a lot of abuse in that regard as well. Until Uthman radiallahu an told him himself that okay, you know, you, you don't, don't do anything. And when Ali radiallahu an had been given the bay'ah, when, when his father had become the khalif, after that he never left his side. He never left his side and he was with him in, in all of the, in everything that Ali radiallahu anhu fought after that. And when Ali radiallahu anhu passed away, there was the people that were around Ali radiallahu anhu, they just could not go with anybody else and they pledged allegiance to him. He had, he had um, numerous, numerous children. Numerous children from many different, many different wives. Because he was, he had this, you know, he, his feeling was that he wanted to have more people linked with the Prophet's family, and he was from the Prophet's family. So he would marry and then he would divorce her, 
and then he would marry somebody else and he would divorce her. And they'd be happy to do that because then they link with the Prophet Wasallam. But he only left Hassan, Al-Muthanna and Zayd. Two, two sons from all of that. He only left two sons. Now, as I said, very gentle, very peace-loving. And the Prophet Wasallam's prophecy about him was there as well. So when he was given the pledge, his father had already prepared an army. Finally got an army together before he was killed, before he was martyred. Radiallahu an karam Allahu He was he had prepared an army to go and fight against the people of Sham. And look at the resolve of Ali radiallahu an. All of these areas have fallen, but yet Ali radiallahu an he has to look after the Khilafah, which he thinks is what he has been rightly given, he has to fulfill it. And he thought the other sides were completely wrong. Muawiyah and Ali radiallahu would pray against each other. In the Salat and so on, they pray against each other because they felt the other one was wrong. Right, and that they were causing the problem. So they would pray against each other. But nowhere did they do la'an. There's a difference between praying against the other to stop them and this, that and the other. But they never did la'na. La'na means the curse of Allah be upon you. It was never to that level because that would mean that they would consider the other to be kafir. Because you can only do la'an of kafir. Right? They never did that though. So he had got this, he had, he had the army ready. So... Hassan radiallahu anh, couldn't do anything about that he, had, he allowed that to continue And he finished you know, he, Because that was his father's resolve So he, he got them ready And on top of them he sent Qais ibn Sa'd Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Wanted to bring to reality That which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Had already prophesied about him And Hassan radiallahu anh, Looked at his situation his, The pledge that people had given him Obviously, he was not in the position of his father. The, because for the, many of the elect Sahaba who you'd have to have on your side, he was a smaller child, they respected him and so on, but Ali radiallahu anh, you can't compare with Ali radiallahu anh, his children. You know. So, his bay'ah was not general, it was to the people of Kufa. They had entered into that pledge. And in fact, not even all of Iraq was, had, had pledged yet. And if you look at it from the other side, that even if they all did, you can't establish a state with the people of Iraq. That's what he thought to himself. That's what the historians say. You couldn't establish a strong state with the people of Iraq. Because there was always disputes among them. They were always arguing and bickering. And they were always trying to go after things that were not theirs. In fact, they would even, they would even dispute with him for the carpet that he was sitting on. That's how he looked at his situation. Now, if he was a stubborn man, he could have fought to his death. Hussein radiallahu anhu was different. Hussein radiallahu anhu went right to the end. Right? Despite so many people telling him, don't bother, don't do it. He said, no, this is my right. I have to do it. He's completely right in what he did. That's up to him. Right? Hassan radiallahu anhu was, no, I'm not going to do this. So, he sent, a, he sent, a, he, he sent to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, and he extended to him a hand of reconciliation and peace. And it's in detail that he actually went with a whole group of people towards Sham. And Muawiyah went with a whole group of people towards Hassan. Now he knew Hassan radiallahu an, and he knew that I'm going to be able to, we're going to be able to agree on something with him. So he went in a large group and they met together. And Hassan radiallahu had certain conditions. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu literally gave him a sealed, a, a, a empty paper with a seal on and said, write on there and demand whatever you want. It's all agreed upon. Because Hassan radiallahu anhu said a number of things. He said, we have become very used to giving away to a lot of people. And if we don't, you know, if you can, if you can allow us huge amounts of, you know, wealth to give out to people, that's one condition. Because there's a, a lot of people that depend on us and we've just got this habit of giving out. And we can't have that stop. Because he was asking, take, you know, what, what do you want? So he says, okay, that's one of the things. The other thing is, anybody who had supported Ali radiallahu anh and him, they should all be set free, they, meaning they should, that nobody should confront them in any way whatsoever. Muawiyah radiallahu anh accepted everything. So then they met. Then after that they met. Uh, they actually met after that Initially there was a, a letter that he had sent And this was agreed upon by letter And the empty letter was sent 
uh, from Mu'awiyah to write down whatever he wanted. Mu'awiyah agreed with everything. And finally, Hassan radiallahu an and Mu'awiyah they met. And Hassan radiallahu an took the pledge, Khilafah, with him and his entire army with Mu'awiyah radiallahu an. And by this, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whatever he had said, came absolutely true. That this this son of mine is a true leader. He's a true leader, and maybe Allah, and it's hoped that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reform by him two major groups of the believers. And by his accepting Muawiyah as the Khalif, this second phase of the Khulafa al Rashidin, of their rule and their Khilafah, came to an end. And that second phase, the first phase was of glory and victory and greatness. The second phase which had begun when? From the murder of Uthman radiallahu an, finally came to an end. This was the phase of trials and tribulations and disputes and, and fights. And Hassan radiallahu an gave up the Khilafah to Muawiyah radiallahu an. And that also ended the 40 years that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had said, the Khilafah after me will be for 30 years. So 40 years after the migration, but 30 years after the demise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so Ali radiallahu an was martyred about six months left in that 39 and a half years. Hassan radiallahu an was there for about six months. And then he gave you up to Muawiyah radiallahu an. The thing about this was that these were such severe disputes that if it was in any other religion, they probably could not have lasted the way this ummah has lasted. The way this ummah has lasted until it's got to us today in a decent amount of unity. Yes, we've got the Shiites out of that. Right? You know, we've got these extreme Rafidites out of that, right? Um, not all Shiites. When I say Shiites is a very general term. Because if I say all Shiites, then that's wrong because there are some Shiites who do not believe that Ali should have been the Khalif, the first Khalif. They just believe that his virtues are better than Uthman and Abu Bakr and Umar. But they were rightfully Khalif in the right sequence. That's fine. But then you've got the other extreme, one extreme that considers Ali to be God, to be a deity. So you've got numerous things and Ali al had been told many things that there will be a group who will, die, who, will, who, will be, who will be destroyed because of their extreme love for you and there will be a group who will be destroyed because of their extreme hatred for you. So Ali radiallahu anhu was a very amazing personality that various different people were attracted to him in different ways and some of them went to the extreme. Inshallah we'll give some more perspective about this next week to just finish that off and then we will talk about Hussein radiallahu an which is something else that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi had spoken about and that becomes unfortunately that is probably even more grievous than some of the things that we've heard and just the final few things that after this it went into from Muawiyah radiallahu an after that it went to his son Yazid and that's when the murder of Hussein radiallahu an took place years afterwards. But the Ummah, after Hassan gave up the Caliphate to Muawiyah an, everything became settled again. And the Ummah was one again. And there was that unity and there was that peace and understanding. Yes, there were people that were left behind uh, from both factions, that they would say bad things about each other and so on and so forth. But as a whole, the Muslim Ummah was together again. And back started the conquests. And the enemies became frightened again because until now the enemies were quite happy with what was going on but now the enemies became frightened again because Muawiyah was one of the first to start a marine force an armada at sea he was one of the first to do that and in that Islam went way beyond up to Cyprus you know, Cyprus was taken at that time as well so back with Muawiyah with Ali he was, it was like Abu Bakr he was dealing with quelling all of the problems after the Prophet ﷺ had passed away. Then Umar ﷺ came and, mashallah, took it to glory. Uthman ﷺ came and added to that. And at the end, there were problems that started there. Ali radiallahu anhu was just, with whatever he inherited, he was just dealing with that throughout his life. Imagine these four years of his life. Can you imagine how tough they were? Subhanallah. May Allah reward him greatly for all of that. We're just praying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obviously uh, radiallahu anhu maradu anhu already, as the case is anyway, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with him. And he's that one Sahabi who has uh, the, uh, the ulama say that you should say Karram Allahu Wajha. Because 
the, the people then used to say, Sawad Allah The Munafiqeen used to say, May Allah blacken his face. So, Karram Allah May Allah ennoble his face. That was a specific dua for Ali radiallahu an. An absolutely great warrior. Young man when he started with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa starting as the first Muslim. Right? First Muslim among the youth. And then this is how he ends. But that tells us that this life is not what it's really, really about. And the most pious people and the more pious you are, the more you will be tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you will be tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the amount of tests. You'd think that Islam was great. You know, the meaning Islam uh, had reached its great dominance. But then after that, the troubles came from within. The troubles came from within because there were certain weaknesses. And when people started to commit certain wrongs and ills. So these internal things came up which are worse than the outside. Because you lose your unity in that case. There was a man called Hakam. And he had a son called Marwan. And the Prophet ﷺ said many things about the children of this Hakam. And Marwan was one of them. He was very close to Uthman at the time. And he took a lot of advantages at that time. Of the gentleness of Uthman radiallahu an. And then from his son, all of these Khalifs that came. So the Prophet ﷺ had actually cursed his children except the believers among them. And one of them is Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So he's, the Prophet ﷺ made, an, made a point to make an exception. He cursed them, but he made a point to make an exception. And that exception, one of them was Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and whoever else. But after Yazid, it went into these children of Marwan, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, then Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik, and, and on and on, and Walid ibn Abdul Malik, and they were ajib. They, the Baytul Mal was theirs to deal with however they wanted. They, they were drunk, so one of them used to come for Fajr in a drunken state to lead the Fajr prayer. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ saw dreams in which he says that I've seen the children of, of, uh, of, uh, of this man uh, climbing on the mimbar and it frightened him. That this is to show that they're going to get it. And they're going to cause great chaos and great problems. And it was during their time that Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was the governor. And when so many Sahaba lost their life. So many leftover Sahaba lost their life at that time. So the time of the Umayyads, these are the Umayyads, was though there was glory in a sense that they were really strong against the disbelievers and all of that but when it came to the inside in terms of the internal destruction no respect for good scholarship good knowledge and so on then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with them and then came the Banu Abbas and they did a lot better obviously there were the bad elements among them as well but they did a lot better they did a lot better and then after they went away then after that it was for a short time it was the Ayyubids, it was the Mamluks, it was the, the, the two Lunids in this area, the Khawarizm Shah in that area. It was the different, then we had the Tatars and we had different problems. It's been a never ending story and it hasn't ended. But I'll tell you one thing, that what we see today and what we have experienced today, what we experience in our life in these last 10, 15, 20 years is nothing, is absolutely nothing compared to what they fared before. Is absolutely nothing in terms of the challenge to us. It is nothing. And may Allah protect us. May Allah not allow us to have to face up to that challenge. May Allah grant us well-being because a lot more serious things have happened. And if you read the pages of history, you will understand that. But you will be proud of your faith because it will prove to you that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what happens. As long as you stay with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is with you. And at the end of the day, you've got, you've got yourself to be answerable for. And Islam will continue. And Islam will continue and it's up to you to be the Muslim, to be the believer and to be with the, with the faith. So that, that is our main responsibility. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow the sacrifices of all these great people before us not to go in vain. For it to teach us a lesson and for us to be able to take heed and not do those things. And be able to abstain. اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تباركت يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث اللهم يا حنان يا منان لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين جزا الله عنا محمد ما هو أهله جزا الله عنا محمد ما هو أهله اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وعافنا واهدنا وارزقنا اللهم اغفر لأمة سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم 
اللهم اغفر لموتانا المسلمين الذين شهدونك بالوحدانية وماتوا على ذلك اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم الأموات اللهم اغفر اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وعافنا واهدنا وارزقنا اللهم اغفر لنا ولوالدينا ولمشائخنا ولأساتذتنا ولطلابنا ولإخواننا ولأخواتنا ولأزواجنا ولأولادنا ولكل من له حق علينا ولكل من أوصانا بالدعاء اللهم ارحمهم وعافهم واعف عنهم اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك من نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاذك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم والله والله Grant us the love of your Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O Allah, grant us the, your love and the love of those who love you. O Allah, establish our hearts on your faith. O Allah, allow us to be readers of the Qur'an. O Allah, in a way that they enter in, it enters into our hearts. O Allah, that you illuminate our hearts with it. O Allah, that you illuminate our hearts with it. O Allah, don't allow us to forsake the Qur'an or the teachings of the Qur'an. O Allah, allow us to adhere to the Qur'an, be obedient to the instructions in the Qur'an. O Allah, allow us to fulfill your rights and the rights of your Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O Allah, and to fulfill the rights of all these great pious personalities, the companions of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Radhi Allahu anhum ajma'een. O Allah, you are pleased with them and they were pleased with you. O Allah, O Allah, allow us to aspire to be like them. O Allah, aspires to learn from them. Oh Allah, oh Allah, your messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given these people. Oh Allah, don't allow an ounce, an ounce of animosity or hatred or bad feeling to come into our hearts about any one of them. Oh Allah, whatever they did, they did under their own understanding. Oh Allah, you know it and you will, oh Allah, you know it and you, we, will, we will leave that to you. Oh Allah, don't allow us to say any bad words about them. Oh Allah, keep our hearts pure and clean. Oh Allah, we have already enough sins to deal with. Oh Allah, we already have enough challenges. Oh Allah, we already have enough things to seek forgiveness for. We don't want other things to taint our Iman. Oh Allah, keep our Iman strong and our conviction strong. Oh Allah, give us such conviction that it makes us it makes it easy for us to follow our faith. O oh Allah, allow us to abstain from the wrong and the haram and the bad things. O oh Allah, allow us to do the good things. O oh Allah, make us all observant of our prayers on time with jama'ah as far as possible. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, those of us who have missed prayers, O oh Allah, allow us to fulfill them. O oh Allah, to, to make them up. O oh Allah, oh Allah, allow us to focus on our wudu as well as Ali radiallahu anh counseled on his deathbed. O oh Allah, these are small things which were so great for these people because that was the secret of their greatness. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, despite all of that, O oh Allah, O oh Allah, grant us your forgiveness. O oh Allah, despite our shortcomings, grant us your forgiveness. O oh Allah, grant us your forgiveness. And grant us a place in Jannah to fill those. O oh Allah, accept our du'as and save us and our progenies. O oh Allah, make Islam elevated in this country and all over the world. O oh Allah, protect your faith, protect the people of your faith. O oh Allah, protect their interests. O oh Allah, protect their centers and their institutions, their masajid, their marakis. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, O oh Allah, support all of us. O oh Allah, strengthen all of us. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzat. Uh, the point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan Courses so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules. And at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam, and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind. You can continue to leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.